You know, the arrival of Jesus, we think about that at Christmas time, the arrival of Jesus. The arrival of Christ, the arrival of the Messiah of Israel during that time when the Romans occupied Israel, it was expected and it was also unexpected. Many of the Jews have been waiting for centuries for the arrival of the son of David, to retake the throne of King David, rule over all the nations from Jerusalem. They knew what their ancient scripture said, that God had made promises to Abraham and to David. To Abraham, he was promised the land. He was promised a multiplying seed. He was promised that his seed would bless all the other families and nations of the earth. And they knew those were only partially realized throughout Israel's history. They knew also that even Moses had predicted there would come another prophet that would be like Moses but greater than Moses and the people of Israel were to give heed to that prophet. On the other hand, faith kind of grows weak and cold over time where longings are not realized and people feel they've been waiting too long. Men tend to gravitate towards the things they like to think about, sort of short-sighted goals and their own personal lusts. And so the long-expected one came not to be expected by some. The faith of the earlier generations of the Jews faded, and it became distorted in some cases. People focused on life here and now. Does that sound familiar, by the way? Furthermore, the prophecies of the coming Messiah were purposefully embedded by God in prophetic texts that spoke of things that were close at hand in Old Testament times, but transcended those contexts and spoke also of something that was far off and distant. And they would transition from one to the other without any preparation. And so it was easy for them to not understand those prophecies because they were embedded in a subtle way. This was certainly true of the prophecy of the resurrection of the Christ in Psalm 16 where David is speaking of his own plight and then right from his own mouth he Praise, thou will not allow thy holy one to undergo decay, making a prophecy of the holy one, not himself, but the Messiah never suffering decay and being resurrected. That was certainly true of the virgin birth where the king was asked to go ahead and ask for a sign from God and God would give him any sign. And we read in Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So some, in Jesus' day, were tuned in to the prophecies being fulfilled around them. Many were not, however. They missed what God was doing. It would be evident from our perspective, retro, kind of looking back and seeing, oh, why couldn't they figure this out? But if you were living in the day and age, and you had had so many generations before that had been waiting for him and had not come, you might think, maybe this is not going to happen. So there were some that were out of tune. They missed what God was doing. They failed to grasp the implications of the events that were happening around them. Incredible implications for the rest of humanity, for the rest of all time, were happening right in their spot of the globe. They missed it. Nevertheless, the story of the arrival of the Jewish Messiah to suffer, to bleed, to die, then to be raised from the dead, it was all in the law and the prophets. They had it right there. After the resurrection, do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples when even they had a hard time believing he'd risen from the dead? And he said, I'm not a ghost, touch me, give me something to eat, I'll prove these are my marks, you know, that I had on the cross, I've been risen from the dead, it's not a joke, it's not some spiritual truth, it's literal and it's tangible. He looked at his disciples and he said, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me, Jesus said, in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. It was there. Like Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6, written 700 years before Jesus was even born. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on who? Him, right? Him. Substitutionary atonement of the Messiah embedded in prophetic passages in the Old Testament. 
These Old Testament predictions followed along the lines of fulfilling the promises to Abraham. Promises were given to Abraham. Then came the law and Moses. Then came David and then came Elijah. And eventually came the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the span of history. But the things that happened later were in fulfillment of things that happened earlier, but put more flesh and more detail on the bones, so to say. They were meant these prophecies about the Messiah, they were meant to bring to completion the law of Moses. To bring to a end, or to a fulfillment, the promises that God made to King David about his throne in Jerusalem. In short, the Old Testament was incomplete. It wasn't meant to be a complete book. It didn't end with an ending chapter. It was still open. Something was still coming. And that that something that was coming had to happen to make everything that happened earlier make sense. The Old Testament was incomplete. It was imperfect. It was waiting fulfillment. Today, we are believers. We are New Testament believers. We are in New Testament times, New Covenant times. And in the beginning of that time, the beginning of the New Testament, there was a speech given by a man named Stephen. He is, and will always be known as, the very first Christian martyr, for he suffered and died for his faith in Jesus Christ. And he laid out a good portion of the long history of the Jews to bring it up to his present day. He does this not only to defend his own personal teachings that he was teaching about Jesus as Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament, but he, he, he presents this long history of Israel to actually turn the tables on his accusers and on his judges. And he shows that they and people like them throughout Israel's history are the ones that have been resisting God and opposing the movements of God's spirit. And they did that because of stubborn unbelief. Sometimes it is religious people that are most stubborn against the things of God. You wouldn't think that's true, but that's true. Now, Stephen's speech is not really a full defense of the teaching of Jesus from the Old Testament. It doesn't really even mention any of the Messianic prophecies that are there in the Law and the Prophets. But he does track the whole history to show that there was patterns that were there. There was truth that carries on into the New Testament, and he uses that to defend what he's teaching and preaching about Jesus as the Messiah. The text today is very long. But I want to read the whole discourse, and then I want to return to the beginning, and we'll see how far we can get along in it. It's going to be multiple parts, obviously. We're going to start moving through it. We're going to learn lessons from the Old Testament, how they pointed in different ways forward towards a fulfillment, towards Christ. Take your Bibles, follow along. Acts chapter 7. The book of Acts comes right after the four Gospels, and it's the history of the church. We're in chapter 7. We're going to read verses 1 all the way to verse 53. So follow along. Thy priest said, said Stephen, are these things so? And he said, hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him move to this country in which you are now living. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke to this effect that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. Yet God was with him and rescued him from all of his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all of his household. Verse 11, now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction with it, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. 
On the second visit, Joseph made himself known to the brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all of his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and our fathers died. From there, they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. This is a lot of detail, isn't it? It's going through the whole thing here. But really, it's just a sketch. Hang in there. Verse 17. But as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. It was at this time that Moses was born, and he was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered into his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Verse 30. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their groans And I have come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers, and he received living oracles to pass on to you. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us, for this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. At that time, they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands, but God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven As it is written in the book of the prophets, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god Rampha and the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob, but it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, 
As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of a house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Now, if you're trying to win over friends, that's not the way to do it. And we'll save the response in verse 54, which was quick and angry and immediate to slay him for a future lesson. As you read that, some people have wondered, wow, that's a long speech. That man knew the scriptures. He was able to recount the history accurately. And he was doing more than that. He wasn't giving a bare bones history lesson. He was showing patterns that were there, present And those same patterns showed up in the time of Christ and the Jews. And that's really how he's making his defense of Christianity. It's not by doing it the way Peter might have done in another message or some of the others might have done, quoting this verse and showing its fulfillment in Christ. But looking at the whole stretch of history, the way God works, the way men resist the way God works, seeing that same pattern in the time of Christ and then bringing down the hammer of judgment upon those that were sitting in judgment of him. It's an amazing speech, amazing indeed. Before we dig into verse 1, I want to say a few words about the speech. You might have guessed it is the longest of all the speeches in Acts. Like many of the others, it is an evangelistic message, but unlike others, it gives little hope or optimism in it. It focuses on the failure of Israel and this Sanhedrin body that he was preaching to that represents the entire leadership of the entire nation of Israel. It's an opportunity for them to repent, but it's more those opportunities have been given and now God is getting ready to judge you. It's a little stronger and harsher than Peter's previous addresses to the Sanhedrin. Another important feature of this speech is that it was given under a time of duress in Stephen's life. Looking backward into chapter 6, you can read that Stephen was dragged out of the synagogue where he was teaching and he was brought against his will to stand before the Sanhedrin, which is a body of multiple people, some 70 or plus people that are there, others that are standing around. There are men that know a lot. There are men that have studied scripture a lot. And he's placed in front of them. He has no defense attorney and he has to speak for himself. Tough spot. Most of you would have crumbled. I know I would have melted in this kind of a situation. How do you speak to an august body like that that's so knowledgeable and be forced to explain your teachings with a little time to prepare? Dr. Longenecker in his commentary writes, Stephen with his life at stake was speaking under intense emotion and with God-given eloquence. It's amazing the eloquence he came up with under that pressure. As Stephen was speaking, he considered himself an Israelite. Please notice in verse 2, he said, Hear me, brethren. These are not Christian brethren. These were brethren that were Jews, right? And then he says, and fathers. He actually gives honor to these men that have repudiated Christ up to this point in time out of respect for their position. He speaks as a Jew to Jews and calls on them to hear the history of what God has done to their people. He develops the defense of his teaching about Jesus entirely from the Old Testament by showing the the trends in the Old Testament, the patterns in the Old Testament, and yes, the incompletion in the Old Testament. He quotes here from Genesis, from Exodus, from Deuteronomy, from Isaiah, from Amos. He's steeped in the understanding of the law and the prophets. He uses the Greek form of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. After all, he's a Greek-speaking Jew. He's a Hellenist. He's one of the seven that was chosen to be those deacon-like leaders under the apostles to help with the problem of the widows, what we saw in chapter 6. He's a great leader, though, and he's obviously a great speaker. He's a man that's steeped in Scripture. It's no wonder the congregation had great confidence in this man. In terms of the actual content of the speech, some wonder why Stephen gave it. They wonder what was his purpose. He seems to just be talking at times, doesn't he? It seems longer and and meandering at times. Dr. Clinton Arnold speaks to this 
He writes, one may wonder what it has to do with the charges that were brought against Stephen and why Luke takes the space to record it in all of its details. At first glance, he writes, it seems merely to be a tedious recounting of the history of Israel. A closer examination in light of ancient rhetoric, however, demonstrates that this is a powerful address aimed at refuting the charges leveled against Stephen. And he goes on with a quote. The speech, I think is actually a response to the formal question given in verse 1 where the high priest, probably Caiaphas, looked at him in his pride and said concerning the accusations, are these things so? The man has a chance to give a defense for himself. And so the high priest is giving him that opportunity. And that question itself is based on the accusations. If you just look back to chapter 6 and verses 8 through 15, you can see that they slandered him. They slandered Stephen there. They spoke against him. They twisted his words, and they brought accusations against him so they'd have justification to drag him before the courts. I think the sermon does address the, concern, the concerns that were raised by the accusers and the points that the council had interest in. I think that he did address them. In order to defend his Christian teaching, he decided to recount these great movements of Old Testament history. He starts with Abraham's call in Genesis chapter 12. Then he moves on to Moses. He goes to the patriarchs, then to Moses, then to David and the time of the temple, and even mentions some of the prophets beyond that. He, he highlights three recurrent themes in this long speech. He highlights the sovereign grace of God that keeps working throughout all of Israel's history. He highlights the continuous resistance of the people of Israel towards their own God. And he also highlights that God is at work in other places besides the actual boundaries of the promised land. That God called Abraham in Ur, that he worked with his people in Egypt, and that God is not contained to this temple in Israel. The Bible Knowledge Commentary points this out. There is a progress and change in God's program, God was creative and innovative in his dealings with humans and particularly with Israel. God went from working with the entire human race, as we read when they got off of the boat, Noah's boat, a flood that flooded the entire human race. Then they began to spread. God wanted them to spread, but they came together, they made a name for themselves, or at least tried to with the Tower of Babel. Much time has gone beyond that. God went from dealing with the entire human race, seeing that they were again turning aside from following his ways. So in his mercy and his grace, he picked one man, one man out of all of the population in the entire world, and he said, I'm going to work all of my saving purposes through that one man, and I'm going to make magnificent promises to him, and that man was Abraham. And that's why he picks up with the story with Abraham. Because this really has to do with the nation of the Jews. This has to do with the Israelites, with the Hebrews. And so he's narrowing that focus to look on what God did through them. And of course, all of this is meant to lead to the New Testament, to the time of Jesus. Remember, the New Testament isn't even written yet. And so it's being preached by the apostles. And all this truth is new to the Jews. And they're trying to show that all this that has happened in and around Israel, everything in the life of Jesus the Nazarene, all of that brings to conclusion all of this history. And he's trying to point that out. He's trying to help his brethren to see that. I think Stephen also had a wider audience in mind than just the Sanhedrin. He knew that that he was giving a public speech. He knew that it would be recorded. He knew that people would, would talk about the things that he was going to say, and he wanted others to understand. He wanted to be able to draw them in. He wanted to bring their understanding into the way that God has worked. He wanted to make sure that larger group of Jews was listening in and understood the movements of God throughout history and why Jesus, and Jesus alone was the fulfillment of that. By moving through so much of Israel's history, he was allowing the Jews to put his words in that that historic context, that broad mural that was back there and his words here to see how it all fit in. He was building context, building a frame for them to see and understand how did, how did all of the scriptures fit together and how does that lead to the New Testament. The Old Testament anticipated a fulfillment. That fulfillment is in Jesus. And that is why the speech ends up turning the tables on the Sanhedrin council. Sanhedrin. 
and indicting them for having the same stubborn and and stiff-necked kind of will against God that had been seen repeatedly throughout Israel's history. That here God was doing a new and a great thing and fulfilling his promises, and there they were again resisting God, just like their fathers. You remember what Jesus said to a group of Jews in John 8 when they said, Abraham is our father And he said, God was the father. And Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came forth from God and he sent me. Now, some might consider this speech to be reckless in that he doesn't really say anything to alleviate the tension. If he was trying to escape punishment, this is the wrong thing to say. But Stephen chose words purposefully. Because they attacked his integrity, more importantly, they attacked his teaching, and they sat as judges of this, and he turned the whole tables on them as if he was the spokesperson of Christ and indicting them, as if Jesus himself were speaking through this man and giving this counsel one last time to repent. How could they know all the history? How could they have all those prophets? How could they have the living oracles of God? How could they have all of that teaching, all of those commandments, all of those events of God, and miss the whole point? I guess it's not too hard to figure out. People are doing it today. They're going to church, and they're reading scripture readings, and they're having the 500th sermon preached to them, and they don't know what it's about, and they don't know their God. They sit there thinking they're good people, And they can get to God by their good works. And they missed it all. It's amazing. Again, back to Dr. Longenecker. He brings this out. Stephen's speech was a powerful portrayal of God's dealings with Israel. And it mounted inexorably to a climax that unmasked the obstinacy and disobedience of Israel and their leaders in Stephen's time. Church history knows a few, if any, greater displays of moral courage than Stephen showed in this speech. Man was ready to die for his faith. He walked in there ready to die. He didn't know this was going to happen at the beginning of his day. He lived each day dying. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, pick up your what? Cross. Oh, that we could be a little more like this. This speech results with Stephen's death by stoning but not before he gains a vision of the glorified Christ standing at the right hand of God. We'll talk about why that's important. This speech and the aftermath also brings to conclusion the first section of the book of Acts, the time where the church was born and grew in Jerusalem, in and around Jerusalem. The hostility that had been developing with the authorities, is kind of brought to a climax here. From this time forward, Jerusalem will be mentioned again and again in the book of Acts, but the focus of Luke in writing Acts will no longer be what God is doing around Jerusalem, but how it begins to spread because of the persecution and how the church begins to go out in waves to other parts of the world. So what I want you to get from this today and in the weeks to come is that God works out his plan his gracious plan, his sovereign plan in history, even when men resist it. But why be one of those men or one of those women who resist it? Why? Today I'm going to borrow Dr. MacArthur's outline that Stephen really is making a defense of himself against the fourfold accusations back in verses 11 through 14 in particular. Stephen was accused of four things, blaspheming God, speaking against Moses, speaking against the law, which is similar, and then speaking against the temple. Now, those are the things that the Jews loved, right? They they supposedly loved God. They loved their temple. They loved the law. They loved Moses. And he was accused of speaking against all of them. And so what do we see? We see that he, generally speaking, addresses this. It's not that he's going point by point in some rigid outline, but he generally addresses this. Generally speaking, you see a high view of God's glory in verses 2 through 16 where he really gives his understanding of God and that he's not a blasphemer of God. And then you see him focus on Moses in verses 17 through 37. That's his view of Moses. He talks about the law in verses 38 through 43, and he ends with the tabernacle and the temple and what happens beyond that in verses 43 through 50. And then there's a conclusion where he indicts his leaders 
uh, in verses 51 through 53. So we'll use that as our outline. Today we'll just talk about God's glory. First, verses 2 through 16. And let's go back to that. Let's read verses 2 uh, and following there just to regain the context. This is about God and his glory. It says, The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran, verse 3, and said to him, Leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. And then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him move to the country in which you are now living. Remember, the speech happens in the promised land, in the land of Israel. We'll stop there. So Stephen starts with the life of Abraham. Not all the way back to Adam and Eve. He could have done that. There was a promise that was made to Adam and Eve. They were told that there would be a Messiah that came. He doesn't talk about that. He focuses on Israel's history. And he starts by saying, God is the God of glory. He goes on to show by God's actions that God is also a God of graciousness, of love, of mercy, of reaching out and helping. So God is the God of glory. God is the God of grace. The God of glory, of course, means God possesses glory and he expresses glory. Israel knew God as a glorious being, a bright, shining, glorious one. This glory was beheld on Mount Sinai by the Israelites. It's recounted in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 24. Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. And so God was known to be the glorious being. When the temple was dedicated in 1 Kings chapter 8, Verses 10 and 11, again, the glory of God was accentuated. It says there that it happened that when the priest came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. They knew this was their God. He's a God of glory. Stephen was accused of blasphemy, but he immediately showed that he had a high view of God, just as the Old Testament teaches. And understand this. The God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament, right? He is one of wonder and glory and might. John, a Jew, in the New Testament affirms this. 1 John 1, 5, he says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Paul, a Jew, writing 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, God alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, glory, whom no man has seen or can see. Even if you tried to gaze into God, you couldn't see it. The light is too bright. You say, maybe I'd see an outline. You would see nothing. So Stephen was by no means a blasphemer of God, as they accused. He openly spoke reverently of the God of glory. And furthermore, please notice that Stephen claims Abraham as his own father, just like them, right along with the other Jews. He puts him, himself into this speech, and he says, yeah, I'm in this also. I, I'm a physical Jew. I'm in that line also. And then he speaks of the grace of God. The grace of God is seen in the initiatives that God took in saving Abraham. God in his grace, out of all the people of the earth, as I said, in those days he called only one man. He called Abraham. You say that's because Abraham was better than all the other people. No, it's because God was gracious to Abraham. And then God made incredible promises to him. He said, what did Abraham do to earn that? The answer is nothing. God called him by his own grace. What is grace? Undeserved favor. He said, this is what I want you to do. Leave your family, leave your house, leave everything. Leave it all. Abandon your old life and come to a new land. I'll give it to you. You haven't seen it yet. I'll give it to you and to your descendants. Abraham had seen none of that. The only way forward was to move forward by what? By faith. God is still calling sinners today. Your life's no good. Your life will end. Your life will end in judgment. Abandon your life. I don't care if your father wants you to live a different way. I don't care if your mother wants you to live a different way. You pick up your cross and you follow Jesus Christ. He's still calling sinners today to himself. Abandon your old life. I'll give you a new life. He's still doing that today. Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16, 24. To express this grace, God appeared to Abraham by means of a vision, a great vision. This appearance to Abraham was not in Israel. It was in Mesopotamia. You say, where is that? That's the land between the two rivers. Where is that? That's in modern-day Iraq. It was in the ancient city of Ur that God appeared to him. Stephen reminds them of this little detail, for it shows that God was working outside the boundaries of the land of Israel, even way back then. Now, some have criticized Stephen's speech with some of the details, and we're going to touch on this because they talk about contradictions in the Bible, and there's an historical discrepancy here and there, and here's, here's one of them. 
they think that there's a contradiction as to where God had this vision with Abraham. In Genesis chapter 11 and verse 31, it states that Abram, not yet called Abraham, Abram was in a city called Haran when the call of God came to him. It says, Abram and his father Terah traveled as far as Haran and settled there, and then Terah died in Haran. In the next verse, chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram. So it seems the vision came in Haran, not in Ur, as Stephen is saying. But there is no discrepancy because in verse 31 of Genesis 11, it says that they left Ur, quote, in order to enter the land of Canaan. The promised land. And why would they already be heading to the promised land if he hadn't already had a vision? So it's obvious where they were heading. He, they got a vision of going to the promised land before they got to Haran. So it must be that the call came to Abram first in Ur, just as Stephen recounts. In fact, Genesis 15, 7 confirms this where God speaks. He says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. So he got the call in Ur. It also appears that in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 4, a second call was given to Abram. So they left Ur to go to Canaan. They stopped in Haran. Terah died there. And then God reaffirmed that call to him. Keep going, in other words. The promised land is still ahead of you. Our text here, Acts chapter 7, verses 2 through 4, confirms that there were two calls. And so Stephen had carefully studied the Genesis text. People that don't study that carefully say, oh, the Bible has an error. But if you give the Bible the benefit of the doubt, look a little deeper, you see that it harmonizes. He picked up on the two stages of the call, and that is why he emphasized that here in his own speech. He was a student of Scripture. By the way, side note on that, right? You think like, well, I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit, and he's going to give me words to say when I'm under duress. You better study your Scriptures, guys. You need to know your Scriptures. This is a man that was steeped in Scripture. If you want stuff to come to mind, it has to be in the mind in the first place. Don't be lazy and say, ah, the Spirit of God moved me. When did this call of Abraham happen? Well, maybe that's not as important to you, but maybe to get a little historical background here, we're told in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 4 that Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. According to scattered chronological notes given mainly in Genesis and Exodus, we find out that Abraham left Haran 645 years before the Israelites left Egypt in the Exodus. This figure is made up of the 215 years of the patriarchal period plus the 430 years in Egypt, a total of 645 years before the Exodus. Since we know the date of the Exodus, right about 1446 B.C., then by adding the 645 to 1446, Abraham was called to enter the land of Canaan in 2091 B.C., and he was born 75 years earlier in 2166 B.C. This places the stories here in what the secular historians call the Middle Bronze Age, long, long time before even Stephen. So this was a long history for the Jews up to this point in time. Now we continue with Stephen's uh, narrative. Notice verse 5. But he, that is God, gave Abram no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. So we'll stop there. So Stephen said this to remind the Jews that the land that they inherited was not theirs because of them. It was theirs because God made a promise to Abraham. They were in the land for sure, but what did that show? It showed the faithfulness of God. It showed that when God makes a gracious promise to Abraham, he's going to keep it. And the possession of the land is linked to the children of Abraham, his seed. Abraham had no property in the promised land. He had tents, he had cattle, he roamed about. It's like he was a nomad. It wasn't really his land. But he was still promised the land, all of it. And so his descendants would be the one that would get it. That's his point. They would possess the land. Verse 6, but God spoke to this effect that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. Verse 7, and whatever nation to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. Remember what God kept saying to Pharaoh Pharaoh Moses. He said, let my people go, right? Why? So they may worship me. These are my people. I want them for my service. I'm the great master. You're claiming to be the master over them. Let go of them. They're my servants. 
and I want them to serve me and minister to me. And Pharaoh kept saying, I don't know this God. Who's the Lord that I should obey him? Remember? Yes, he's talking about Egypt. Yes, this was part of God's plan. Listen, God's plan for his people is not easy. Here, Abraham's going to have all these descendants, and God says, by the way, they're going to be enslaved some 400 years. They're going to have trouble. The 400 years, again, is a rounded number. The actual time was 430 years, according to Exodus chapter 12 and verses 40 to 41. They were enslaved. The descendants of Abraham would be mistreated. They would be treated in harsh conditions. Of course, that happened, and it happened in the land of Egypt. Only after that long and difficult time did God appear to Moses in the wilderness and say, I've heard the cries of my people, and now it's time to release them. God is sometimes hard. God is sometimes hard, and this was his plan. They had to be. They had to be aliens in a foreign land. They had to be enslaved. That was part of what God was teaching them as a people. This world is not fair. This world is corrupt. This world is fallen. This world is sinful. There are harsh consequences in it. My people, to understand me, they're going to have to be enslaved and they're going to have to be mistreated. And after that, I will deliver them. So that nation enslaved them, took advantage of them, and God said, I will judge the nation of Egypt, the greatest nation, the greatest empire in the world of that day. I will judge them and I will judge them harshly. Always God judges evil. Always. Sooner or later. But he always judges evil. And it caught up with the Pharaoh and the ten plagues. And we won't go into all of that. But it culminated with the death of who? Remember? The firstborn sons of Egypt. Terrible, terrible judgment. But one they deserved. That judgment serves to highlight the gracious faithfulness of God to his promises to Abraham. He would not let his people go. He was not going to say, okay, I'm disinterested now. It's been too long. I'm not interested in what's going on on earth anymore. They're slaves. They don't look like a very great nation down there. Gee, there's a lot of other nice nations with greater customs and all of that. He looked on him. He said, this is part of my gracious plan, and I'm going to fulfill it. Verse 8, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. Circumcision is the removal of the male foreskin. It's an intimate sign and meant to be. The covenant had to do with passing on the faith to the children, and so the sign was right there in the act of procreation. It would remind them, you are set apart for God, and your descendants are to keep the covenant with God. By keeping the sign, it showed that Abraham had trust in the promises, and the descendants would continue to keep the sign, because the physical descendants of Abraham were promised this. This sign was to be passed down to the children. Isaac, he's not really given much attention here, is he? But his life is important because he was that promised child to Abraham, that child that he couldn't have, he didn't think he could have in his old age, in the old age of Sarah, but he was the promised child. And and Stephen's kind of skipping over all those details, but they're in the background there. And, And he also was circumcised. Abraham kept the covenant. So then it traces it from Isaac on to Jacob and on to the 12 tribes through Isaac's son, Jacob. Again, Jacob was chosen by the sovereign grace of God over Esau. Remember that? And he he got the favor of his father. And the 12 patriarchs became the 12 heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so the seed of Abraham continued all according to God's gracious plan. It was all leading forward. Don't get that lost as we're hearing all the details. It was all moving somewhere. It was all coming to a culmination. Verse 9 The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt, yet God was with him. Verse 10, and rescued him from all of his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all of his household. Here's a a very brief summary of what is about 10 chapters in the Old Testament, right? The whole detailed story of Joseph, remember that? He had this coat of many colors. He was favored by his father. His brothers were jealous about that, right? Then he started saying, hey, I have dreams. The sun and moon and the the stars came and bowed down before me, and they knew they were talking about his own family. He said, we're never going to bow down to you, right? So they were sick and tired of this loud mouth, this pipsqueak that they had. So they wanted to kill him, but then Reuben stepped in and said, hey, I'm the eldest. I'm going to suffer for this. Let's not kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery to Egypt, get rid of the guy. And so they sold him, and they got pieces of silver from that. Remember that? And Joseph was gone from their life. We don't have to listen to him anymore, right? Wrong. God was all in it. And he goes there, and he has no status. He has nothing, and yet God was with him. You say, but God's with everybody. No, there's special ways in which God is with certain people. It means that God revealed his presence to him in a special way and gave him power to interpret dreams, and he rose to prominence, and and he 
God arranged things so that Pharaoh was desperate and he saw this recurring dream of, of this famine and he didn't know what it was all about. And Joseph explained it to him and basically said, I'm giving you the information that saves your kingdom. And so Pharaoh said, I can't trust anybody except for this guy and made him second in command in all of Egypt. And the, the brothers and Jacob know nothing about this, right? The, the brothers kept the secret. Jacob thinks his son's dead. But it all moved forward according to God's plan. And God was with him, and God worked, and the brothers did evil. But notice they visit him, and and notice that uh, Stephen makes the clear point that it was only on the second visit that his brothers understood that this governor in Egypt who was giving them grain was their brother, Joseph. They didn't get it on the first visit. You remember the story, right? They came, they were sent by Jacob to go down to Egypt because they heard there was a governor there that had preserved the grain and there was a lot of grain and the famine in the land was so severe. And so he sends his brothers down there and they go down there without Benjamin the first time. And Joseph does not reveal himself. And then on the second visit he reveals himself and the brothers recognize their sin and they fall down before him and they fear for their lives. But Joseph forgives them as the brother. Remember that? The first visit, they didn't get it. The second visit, they got it. Don't you see what he's saying? Stephen is telling them, this is the first visit of Jesus Christ. He came to you and you rejected him. You sold him away. You put him to death, but you will recognize him when he comes back. He is your brother and he will come back to save you. That's what he's telling them. It's all embedded in your history. Just watch the types and the flows that are there. Jealousy has even been brought up already. The brothers of Joseph were jealous. But it even says in Acts chapter 5 and verse 17, the Sanhedrin was jealous of the movement of the Christians. It was growing and it was spreading and everyone was talking about Yeshua of Nazareth and they were jealous of this and they wanted to put the light out, but they couldn't. And God had been with Joseph. Obviously, God was with Jesus as well. There are many unforeseen circumstances But God continued to work through Joseph's life and to save the entire clan. Look at verse 11. We'll close with this. Now a famine came over all of Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction with it, and our fathers could not find food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. Verse 13, on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. This is just amazing how God works in the lives of people. He has an amazing patience. He has an amazing ability to stay on task. People make their own decisions. And some of those decisions are wicked and evil. And you think that will distort what God is doing, but it can never stop. But God anticipates everything. He's planned everything, even the evil decisions of people. Jesus was rejected, but Jesus died for the sins of his people. They did not accept him. When he comes back the second time, the Jews will recognize him as their Messiah, and they will weep and cry. And the words of what will happen to the Jews when Jesus comes back a second time, and that could be in our lifetime, when they recognize him, gathered there in the land of Israel right now, that's not a coincidence. That's fulfillment of prophecy, just as God said he would do it. It says in Zechariah 12.10, I will pour out on the house of David. Now it's talking about Jewish people, guys. They can't spiritualize that. I'll pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. They will recognize this was our Messiah and we have resisted him for 2,000 years and he has come back to love us and to save us. That is significant. And then verse 14, then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all of his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all, a reunion, off the land, notice. Verse 15, and Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and our fathers died. Verse 16, and from there they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor and Shechem. And we'll kind of let that set the stage for the deliverance through Moses next time as they're called out of the land of Egypt and back into the land. Let's get our hearts ready for the Lord's Prayer. Just pray with me for the Lord's Supper, I mean. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. There's so much in there. And sometimes as we're studying one portion, we don't get a chance to see the grand sweep of your plan. And so thank you for that privilege from Stephen's speech to see how it all fits together and moves forward in a direction.
to see your glory and to see your grace at every point. And we're just grateful that we can bow and we can uh, remember the one death of Jesus that paid for our sins for all time, that we never re-sacrificed Christ. His one sacrifice was good enough for all, for all time. Thank you that as brothers, we sit around this table and we partake together. In that spirit, we pray. Amen.